Thank you. I wrote most of that bio, but not the smart bit. Um, I was reflecting as I started to develop this presentation on the fact that the first time I ever heard the term semantic web was at the Access Conference. And that was back in 2003. And I'm pretty sure that the person who uttered the fateful phrase was Mark Jordan. So thanks, Mark. This has been a lot of work for me, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> But I am grateful because the concept really seized my imagination then and it's become a major research interest for me over time. So I did a lot of reading and writing on the semantic web, but it was really hard to get an opportunity to actually be involved in implementing linked data. Last year I was fortunate enough to take a sabbatical and I went to pursue a master's in humanities computing at University of Alberta and it was there that I got involved in the Quirk project. If you can't hear me at the back, raise your hands, wave, do something to get my attention, okay? I tend to pace around a bit. Um, Quirk is the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory. It is a large digital humanities project that's been funded by the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. And it basically aims to establish an online infrastructure for literary research. So what does that mean exactly? Well, we want to build an authoring environment, a publishing and dissemination environment, and a whole new set of discovery tools that are particularly aimed at literary studies researchers. And like a lot of digital humanities projects, the Quirk project is very, very collaborative. So we have hundreds of people involved in this project from different universities across Canada. There are programmers and librarians and scholars from all different disciplines and um, lots of graduate students as well, of course, doing quite a bit of heavy lifting on the project. And working on a large distributed project is kind of a challenge if you're a little bit control freaky, like some systems people might be, um, because you just are not able to understand every aspect of the project in detail. You're not gonna know everything that's going on, so you really are focusing on a small little piece, and that feels strange sometimes if you're kind of a big picture person. Um, and the particular question that I was working on in this project was how we would implement linked data into the publishing system. So I think that it is worth talking a little bit about why humanists would want to produce linked data in the first place. What would the advantages of linked data be in a system like this? And one of them is that keyword search is just not going to cut it for the kinds of questions that humanists want to ask of their texts. We want to ask very complex questions that we can't ask in keyword search. And the semantic web vision is specifically concerned with allowing computers to negotiate human language. So for text-based kinds of studies, there's a lot of promise for new types of search tools, much more sophisticated types of search tools. And it's not just search. Browse is another thing that we're very interested in. How can we do new ways of browse? And because RDF is a graph-based structure, it holds a lot of promise for being able to browse and visualize and explore really big data sets in new ways. And Jeffrey Rockwell from U of A has a good quote here about you know, understanding the shape of these really big textual stores. How do you know what you want to look for in a data store in the first place? Global common standards are increasingly important as we have all of this data we want to draw together. And in the humanities right now, things tend to be in digital libraries. They're very siloed. There's not a lot of crossover. So there's a lot of legwork trying to sort of go around between all the sources that might be interesting to you. Um, not only will RDF and linked data make humanities projects be able to more easily share their data, but we also hope that it's going to allow us to use data from the sciences, for example, or data that's being published by governments and bring all of that data together in different ways. So interoperability is a big challenge, but it's one of the promises of linked data and the semantic web. The linked data vision assumes that your project is going to want to use data from other people's projects, and it assumes that you're going to share your data with other people as well. One of the principles of linked data is that you must expose your data model on the web for other people to use. So in this way, it doesn't just accommodate collaboration, but it actually enforces collaboration, which is a big deal in the digital humanities right now. Big data is no longer just something that the sciences have to worry about. 
We have enormous tech stores. Google Books is the first example that most of us think of, I think. But there are a lot of different new tech stores in the digital humanities, and they're huge. So we're looking for a framework that's going to be able to handle you know, a lot of data and is going to scale as our projects scale. And linked data is ideal for this because it's designed to work at web scale. It's designed to work across the whole internet. So we know that it's going to grow and be flexible enough to accommodate that data over time. The last thing about text data is that it's really messy. It doesn't sort of fit easily into spreadsheets and databases um, because things just don't fit neatly into a single category. And in most cases, humanity scholars don't want to fit things neatly into a single category because that's not the kind of work they do. So we need a container that is flexible enough to capture a large amount of heterogeneous data. And linked data promises to, be a to, to allow you to do this because you can put things in multiple categories, create multiple annotations, even make kind of competing assertions about things. And this way you can kind of layer interpretation over an entity or over a passage or an object of interest, which is very much in line with the way that humanity scholars do do their work right now, especially literary scholars. So hopefully I've convinced you that there are some benefits to having linked data in our digital humanities project in the first place. Um, so that's kind of the easy part. Now the question was, well, how are we going to do this? How are we going to actually start to try to do this? And nobody on the project had a great deal of experience with linked data, so we were all kind of learning together. The first thing we needed to do was to create a development platform, and we knew that Fedora was going to be the core platform for the Quark system. So we knew we were working with Fedora. That was straightforward. Then we needed a bunch of seed data that we could work with. And in this case, we took data from the Orlando project, which is another digital humanities project. Um, and the data was a bunch of XML documents that represented biographies of British women writers. So lots of different data and that kind of thing. And the Orlando XML schema is based on TEI, but they have a lot of custom tags as well. So it's not a pure TEI XML data set. So like most literary projects, the Orlando text base was built around a document-centric model. And that's kind of the way that the current web works as well. It's very document-centric. On the semantic web, though, we're interested in entities like people, places, things, and concepts. So we need to somehow free those entities from the boundaries of their documents and deal with them individually. So the first thing we had to do was kind of identify the main types of entities, the main classes of entities that were of interest to us in terms of our data store. And we had a huge advantage here with Quark because many of the researchers who did the XML, so had already done a great deal of analysis of those documents and thought about the structure a lot, were part of the team. So we had a lot of advice on how to start to model this data in the first place, which was a huge advantage. And when you're modeling the data, you're going to be working very closely with the people who know the contents. You have to have content experts as well, not just kind of data engineering types. Finally, we agreed that we were going to work on creating representations for events, places, people, organizations, works, which include books and poems and documents, and annotations, so the things that our researchers say about all those other things. And on the current web, only documents have URIs, so you can only link document to document. On the semantic web, each entity has to be individually addressable. So to do this, we give every entity its own URI. And the URIs allow us to establish links directly between entities. So now we can say that this person is linked to this organization, or that this film is linked to this book. By connecting our data in this way, we begin to see relationships that were not previously obvious. So for example, this person is not directly connected to this book. But when we look at this graph, we can see that this person is actually indirectly connected to this book in two ways. She's connected to an organization that's connected to the book, and she's connected to a place that's connected to the book. So immediately, you can imagine new ways of browsing through degrees of separation using this RDF data model. 
Because of the size and complexity of the Quark data store, we're going to have to mint millions of these URIs over time. So we needed to kind of agree on a template for minting URIs, how we were going to actually make sure that we could mint all of those URIs and not duplicate them at any point. The most important consideration when you're minting URIs is that they are supposed to last forever on the semantic web. OK? So other people are going to use your data in their projects. And if your URIs break, you are breaking everybody else's projects down the line as well. So it's really important that your URIs are really sca stable. That means that you have to think about them in terms of like archival time frames, not just within your own project time frame. So one of the ways that you can make your URIs more stable is to abstract away from implementation to details. Don't include anything in the URI that has to do with the technology you're using right now. So this is a very uncool URI. For one thing, it has a server name directly in the URI, Tiger. It's meaningless to the end user, and it's very likely to change over time. For another thing, it has the PHP extension, and we may not be using PHP forever. Um, and it also has a couple of database fields, like parameters in there, so that is not a good stable URI. That's for sure going to change over time. This is a much better URI. And you can use something like Apache Mod Rewrite to make a URI like the top one look like the bottom one. This is something that you're probably going to be able to sort of maintain over a longer period of time. Because the semantic web is built to be shared by humans and machines, we create these canonical URIs. Um, that represent the concept of an entity. And when that URI is invoked, the server does content negotiation, and if it sees that the client requesting the information is a web browser, it assumes you're a human and it returns a nice HTML page formatted for easy reading by humans. Um, but if it sees an intelligent agent or an RDF browser on the other end, it's going to return raw RDF data. Um, so one thing you kind of have to remember when you're minting URIs is that you're not actually minting one URI per object. You're minting at least three different URIs per object and maybe more. So that's something else that you need to take into consideration. In terms of the patterns that people are using, they're kind of all over the place. We have these really great URIs like the one at the top from DBpedia, but they can afford to do nice human readable URIs because they have a process for disambiguating their titles in the Wikipedia data store, which is where they're getting their stuff from, so they can disambiguate and use human readable names. Um, a lot of other organizations choose to go with numbers, because that's a great deal easier to automate. Um, Quirk is kind of using a compromise. We're going to have the top level class, so person, place, thing, organization within our URI, but after that we're going to just use a random string generator to be able to generate a lot of different URIs that are different over time. So it's sort of a compromise. It's not as nice as DBpedia, but we don't have some of the advantages they have either. So we've identified the major classes of entities that we're going to need to represent our knowledge domain. And we've figured out how we're going to assign URIs to our entities so they'll be addressable on the web. But now we need to think about the relationships that exist between those entities. So on the current web, we have URLs, and they create links between documents, but they don't tell you anything about the way in which those documents are related. It's just a, a completely blank link. On the semantic web, our links contain detailed information about the nature of the relationship between those entities. So this person is employed by this organization. Uh, this organization published this book. And whenever you see two entities connected by a relationship like this, in fact, you're looking at an RDF statement in the form subject, predicate, object. So if I were to represent this in actual RDF, I'd be using a URI for each of those things, like the one that you see in the middle of the screen. And this triple actually says that Virginia Woolf, as represented by VF, created, as defined by Dublin Core, Mrs. Dalloway, as represented by DBpedia. So we've identified the major classes of entities and the types of relationships that we'll need to represent our knowledge domain of literary studies. Um, and these are great human readable definitions, like this person was born in this place, this film was adapted from this book. So a human would now be able to derive a certain amount of additional information based on what they're looking at here. So if this is a human, then she must have had parents. If this is a book, it did not have parents, but it must have had one or more authors. If this film is adapted from this book, then 
the book must have been published before the film was released. And that's the kind of reasoning that humans just do instinctively, but that computers do not do at all unless you structure language in a way that they can properly understand it. And this is what we're trying to do with the semantic web, is allow computers to infer new knowledge in the way that humans can infer new knowledge. So these labels are great for humans, but they are not good for computers because language is not really a strength of computers. So we have to model our entities and relationships in a way that will allow machines to perform the kind of reasoning that we can perform. And in order to do this, we use ontologies. One way to think about linked data is that it's basically an accessibility initiative for machines because machines are human language impaired. So ontologies model human language in a way that computers can better understand it. And ontologies do a couple of things. So they provide definitions for entities or classes of things. They provide definitions for the relationship between those entities, and they impose rules to support machine reasoning over those relationships. So the first thing we're going to want to do is start by finding ontologies that give us human readable definitions of our major entities. And you're going to run into this question at some point as you're doing any linked data project. And the wisdom of the semantic web is that we should try to reuse ontologies wherever possible because that creates a much more tightly interlinked web of data and it also reduces the overhead for reasoning. If you do need to build your own ontology, people have various reasons for doing this, they're quite complex to build and once you've published the ontology, you need to make sure that that ontology is going to still be available long after your project has finished. So you'll need to consider how you're going to keep the stuff available on the web because once other people use it, then it still needs to be there over time. And I think that short project funding cycles represent a threat to the stability of URIs and the stability of ontologies on the semantic web. And we need to think about that when we start these projects that are going to end at some point. <clears throat> so how do you find ontologies? Well, there are ontology search engines. So you can actually just put in a term that's of interest and the search engine will tell you what ontologies contain that term or contain definitions relevant to that term. So that's one sort of easy way to start getting familiar with the types of ontologies that are out there. This one's linked to open vocabularies and that's, that's the one that I'm using at the moment. Um, the Quirk project actually did a lot of research to decide what ontologies would be most appropriate for us. And we talked to a lot of other digital humanities projects, especially to see what other people were using because we'd rather all be in the same boat. You know, if we're lost, then at least we're lost together and there are some advantages in that way. Um, so one of the ontologies that we chose to use in our project is the friend of a friend ontology, and that models the class of people. Mostly we chose FOF, not because it's the most brilliantly designed ontology, because I would argue that it probably isn't, but it's really, really widely deployed, and that's a big advantage, um, because your data then is linked to so many other sources. So, the human readable definition of this class person is not very exciting. In fact, you'll see that the definition they give for person is a person. So thanks, guys. But it's not really the human readable definitions that we're interested in in ontology. It's what kind of rules are exposed for computers to understand. So some of the rules, for example, in this, on this screen uh, say that person is disjoint with organization, and person is disjoint with project. So it's telling a computer, if an entity is a person, it's not also a project, and it's not also an organization. These things cannot all be the same. Um, it also says that a person is a subclass of agent. So any rules that are defined for the class agent are going to also apply to this class of objects. For our work class, we chose the Ferber ontology, and Ferber will undoubtedly be familiar to many of you here. Um, and the Ferber ontology here says, for example, that any entity of type work cannot also be an expression, and it cannot also be a manifestation. And it says that any entity of type work is also an endeavor. It's a subclass of endeavor. So when you declare that your entity belongs to a specific class, you accept all of the logic that the ontology exposes for that class. Once you've chosen the ontologies, you have your own data store with your entities over here, and then you have the ontological definitions for the classes over here, and you need to somehow tie those things together. And the way that we do this is using the RDF type predicate. So the first statement here says that 
the quirk entity labeled Virginia Woolf is a person as defined by the faux fontology. And the second statement says that the quirk entity labeled Mrs. Dalloway is a work as defined by the Ferber ontology. So now all of the rules that are defined for those classes are applied to our entities in quirk. And that's how you make that connection between web ontologies and your actual data. Predicates, the relationships between entities, are also assigned URIs and have ontological definitions just like classes. So life partner of is a predicate from the relationship ontology that um, defines relationships between people. And one of the rules for life partner of is that it is a sub-property of fof knows, which means that if somebody is the life partner of somebody else, they also know them. That's the kind of reasoning that is intuitive to human beings but is not intuitive to computers. You have to actually tell computers that kind of thing in order for them to be able to do that sort of reasoning. Um, and another rule says that both the subject and the object of this predicate are people. So when you see life partner of joining two entities, you know those entities are people. So classes and predicates work together to support computer reasoning. And if you give a computer just one RDF triple, it can infer other information that you haven't given it. So at the top here, we indicate that an entity called Wolf is the creator of an entity called Mrs. Dalloway. By reading the ontological definition for creator, it knows that Wolf is a person and Mrs. Dalloway is a work. If we created these two entities with lived in, it's going to assume that Mrs. Dalloway is a place. And if we join the two with life partner of, then it assumes that Mrs. Dalloway is a person. So as long as you give it the right information, a machine can, in fact, infer new knowledge from what you've given it that isn't actually given in the statement. These are just a selection of the ontologies that we thought would be relevant to our project. Um, I've made all the slides available on the internet, so don't feel like you have to madly take notes. Um, you'll be able to download this stuff after the presentation if you're interested. Um, and a lot of these ontologies, I'm proud to say, have roots in the library world. A lot of the controlled vocabularies that we've been working on over time are being adopted in the linked data world. So I feel that there's some really exciting collaboration that's you know, going to keep happening with libraries in this area. So what we've done so far is that we've defined our major entities and relationships. And we've minted URIs to represent those things within the Quirk data store. And we've selected ontologies that will help computers to reason about our entities and relationships. So what we've done really is to create a lovely data model that is not in any way implemented or doing anything in our project just yet. It's just a conceptual model still after all that work. So that's sort of, <sighs> OK. <clears throat> in our real life workflow, what we have are a bunch of humanist scholars writing XML documents. That's what happens in real life. So we have to find a way to take this data model and jam it into the workflow, assuming that the people doing the data creation don't know RDF, don't want to know RDF. Um, and so we need to make it really easy for them to incorporate our data without um, having to really learn a lot of additional stuff. And the way that we are going to do that in Quirk is to use the Quirk Writer which is an online XML authoring environment that includes capability for semantic tagging. So that's what I'm going to show you for the rest of the presentation is the work that is being done right now on Quirk Writer. There's a live demo of this available online. Um, it's very much in development right now, so all features might not work as advertised. So the Quirk Writer looks like a simple online text editor basically, but it has a number of features that support the creation of RDF metadata. If you look at the tagging toolbar along the top of the Quirk Writer screen, you see little icons that represent the entities that I've just been talking about, so people, places, organizations. And it's really easy to incorporate tags. This is a letter written by Bertrand Russell. So if I want to tag Bertrand Russell as a person, all I do is highlight Bertrand Russell and click the person tag. And that's going to pop up this menu. The first menu that you see brings back results from the Quirk authority file. So if we already have an entry for the entity Bertrand Russell, we don't want to create another entry. And you can just select from the authority list the entity that you're interested in. Obviously, over time, 
we're going to have to find new ways to kind of narrow down searches and make it easier for people to search once you've got millions of entities in the system, right? Um, for now, we just have seed data, so it's okay. If it's not in the authority file, then the next tab down allows us to look it up in various web services. So this pulls in entities from distributed data stores that we've identified as being relevant to our data on the web. Um, for example, for people, we're definitely using VF, um, and we have a couple of other services that we will be using eventually. So what's happening behind the scenes is that we're using web services from these data stores to query them, to pull back the relevant information and make them available to our users who can then choose those entities and tag, you know, say, yeah, this is the right Bertrand Russell from VF. I'm going to tag my entity using the VF URI, and that's great. That's fine with us. DBpedia also offers a RESTful API that allows you to send full Sparkle queries if you want to, which is very convenient if you know how to write Sparkle. Um, if you don't like what's in the authority file and you don't find what you're looking for from the web services that we've exposed, then the next tab allows you to put in your own identifier. So maybe I want to use a URI that's in Freebase. I'm free to do that here. I can just paste in my own URI for this entity and it'll go to Freebase and suck back the information from Freebase. If you don't like any of those options, then you can go directly into the authority system and create a new record for that entity. And once you've done that, it's going to be available for you to use in that first menu again. So there are a lot of different options for tagging any of these people, places, things, and entities in different ways. And I think that in an environment where you're working with potentially many disciplines and you know really diverse data, that this is a good way to go. Um, you know, scholars do like to have choice in these systems. So in this case, I've selected the VF link for Bertrand Russell, and I click Add Tag. And now this is what I see in my screen. I have a little box um, on the left-hand side that tells me the information that's been pulled back from VF about Bertrand Russell. And now he appears in red, so I can see things that I've tagged. If I look at the XML at this point, then I can see that temporary tags have been created around this entity to say this is an entity, it's an entity of type person, and to give it a little identifier that can be used to refer back for now. And then there's another section in the header of the XML file that is an RDF description section, and this is where we're actually going to write the RDF um, entity definitions out from this particular part of the file. So you'll see both of those right away. So basically, you go through the document, you identify the major entities, and you tag them with the appropriate entity type. So you can tag places, tag texts or titles, um, organizations, whatever you want. Once you've done that tagging, then in your left-hand pane, you're going to see a list of all the entities that you've created in this document with little icons telling you what kind of entity they were. And this is how we create the relationships. All we've done right now is kind of tag entities saying what classes they are, but we want to be able to define relationships between them, so that's what allows us to do that. We can now click the Add Relationship button, and when we do that, this is very rudimentary still, but you can sort of see what the idea is going to be, and you can imagine how this translates into a triple. You get all of your entities in the subject and object panes, and then there's a predicate pane in the middle that allows you to make connections between them. So if I click on a place, for example, the predicates that are suggested to me are predicates that are relevant to place, or things that take place as their subject, which is very useful because you don't want to offer every possible predicate since we know that they're not all relevant to every, every class of object. You can see we don't have that much data in the system right now, but hopefully you can imagine all the things that we'll eventually allow you to say. Um, so if I choose Bertrand Russell, I see some of the kinds of relationships I can define for Bertrand Russell in the middle, and one of them is parent of. So it happens that he also mentions his son John in this letter, so now I can connect Bertrand Russell and say he's parent of John. And there's a little relationships tab in that left-hand pane that will write out all of the relationships that you've created between entities. The relationships also appear in the, RDF in the XML source file, so you can see an RDF description of the way in which those entities are related as well. And 
although I've talked today about moving away from a document-centric model, the, the fact is that literary scholars are in fact very attached to their documents. You cannot sort of avoid the documents altogether. So when we make annotations and we do this kind of standoff markup, we need a way to link our annotations back to exactly where in the text those things occurred or where they were marked up in the first place. And so we're using the open annotation ontology in order to do this, and that allows you to have annotations that kind of exist on their own in RDF and are linked back to specific spots in the document. So they don't all have to live in the XML, which is good because otherwise you're going to have a lot of overlap as people layer on definitions over time. So that's kind of how we're dealing with the RDF back to XML document connection. Finally, I did a rough diagram for you of what the Quirk Entity Management System kind of looks like from a bird's eye view. And I should tell you that this is not all implemented by far. Um, but the plan is that everything is stored in Fedora. The Quirk writer is writing back to Fedora and Fedora is the, the kind of main entity management system, okay? Um, Fedora populates an Apache Solar Index to allow the Quirk writer to um, read the authority, the authority results. And it also is gonna populate a triple store and the triple store is what's gonna support a lot of the new kind of discovery tools that we'll be developing. So we are still in quite, quite an early time in the project, but this is kind of what it's supposed to look like um, and we'll see how it goes. Obviously things might change over time, but that's our working model for now. And there are so many credits that you have to uh, put up for any presentation like this because there's so many people involved in the funding and working on the projects. But here are some of the main culprits. And um, I have a bunch of related links as well if you're interested in looking at those later. So uh, thank you. The slides are available online if you are interested in looking at them. I warned you earlier that I know a very tiny little slice of this, pro of this uh, particular project, so there are a lot of questions that I can't personally answer. I'm willing to entertain any questions you have now, and I'm very happy to try to find answers to things that I actually may not know about. So I'll open the floor to questions. Lisa, yes. um, you, one of your slides said uh, that the ontology is for life. Yes. That's a great sound bite. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> um, in practice, do you know of any um, strategies for making sure that as ontologies change and that as links to those or relationships defined in those are propagated throughout the semantic web, that as the ontologies change, those don't break? Yeah, versioning and merging entities and dividing and splitting entities up is, is a really difficult question. And it's the same question that we have about our documents, which change all the time. So if you reference a specific thing in one instance of a document, it, that, that isn't necessarily universal. That is to say that you're going to have to keep all of these different versions of your documents over time in order to have the RDF accurately um, link back to, to the piece that was really tagged by a scholar in the first place. I think that most of the big ontology builders have ways in which they are doing this. You, usually what happens is that you're linking to the kind of um, the most recent version of an ontology, and that could be problematic over time. I think that the, the people who like FOF are committed to kind of keeping the old terms when they add the new terms. So um, if you're going to split something into two, you keep the old term, you also add the two new terms, and that that's one way that ontology is kind of dealing with this problem right now. But I think that there are a lot of stability things that we haven't really figured out yet. And if anybody else here is working on anything like this, I'd be happy to hear. Nice work, Lisa. Ah, oh, thanks, Declan. Um, we're running into this right now. We're our, we've been years ago when we started the digital our digital stuff. We I said, okay, the base of the URL is going to be libraries. .ucc .edu. That's never going to change, right? Yeah. Now we're library because right. we closed all these branches <laughs> and stuff. They want to change our name, and so I freaked. I was like, no, you guys committed to this. This is what it was supposed to be. We can't change it. Right. And I finally just went back and drank the old uh, Berners Lee Kool Aid that cool URLs don't break. Right. They can change, they just can't break. Right. So you're, you basically have to commit yourself to redirect hell for the rest of your life 
but that's yes. that's the cost. I think that's that the cost it, of it. The as long is what I found, don't don't be scared of this. Just be consistent. Be consistently wrong if you want to be. Right. Ours are all, all of our predicates are made up library of Congress mods and mix and premise yep. that don't even exist, but they're consistent. And also, one thing you can do inside is make your names of those things uh, triples as well. So you can change them one time once you once you've decided what it's going to be, or, or you can change things later on. So it's it's all turtles all the way down. So absolutely, and you know. Perl and other initiatives that are kind of trying to deal with the persistent URL problem are also part of the solution in some ways for ontologies um, for that particular problem. This is really cool. Oh, I, it's such a great project, and I can't take credit for very much of it, but I'm happy to be able to speak about it at least. Um, I'd just like to make a comment about all of this. I think this is great. Um, there is an important piece of the semantic web document as it was originally written uh, that needs to be understood, which is there is nothing in the original spec that says entities need to be resolvable. And that's crazy. That's flat out insane in 2012. Yeah. So this is the, the good news is all of the work around the linked data initiative, a big part of that has simply been to say, we will put this stuff online. It will resolve to something. Um, I really don't understand how the semantic web spec got released claiming that URIs were unique because they're just big strings. Right. So as you go forward, uh, just keep that in mind and we'll all be better off if there's something that we can point a browser or a computer at and yeah. find something. Definitely, it's not in the spec but when Sir Tim did his linked data principles, he outlined four principles, and one of the principles that he outlined that's become kind of part of the, you know, the, the Bible for the semantic web developers is that your URIs should resolve. So it may not be in the spec, but it's definitely something that, that people in the semantic web world have been trying to embrace, although I've definitely encountered URIs that don't resolve on the semantic web as well. I think it is absolutely best practice to have, have them resolve, which is a lot more work for you as well. <laughs>